Thank you everybody for joining. Um, my name is Abigail and I'm an organizer for TIA Divest. I've organized in the climate movement for the last six years and started by supporting the Line 3 fight in Minnesota. Um, as I've been organizing with TIA Divest, I've noticed that many TIA clients believe that TIA is a stellar company who is responsible and transparent about where money is being invested into. However, tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about what they're lacking in transparency and how some of their farming operations are impacting local communities. We will first hear about TIA's practices from Doug Hertzler, who is a senior policy analyst with ActionAid. We will then hear from Jennifer Hadlock, who is an attorney from New York City, currently working with the Elaine Legacy Center Foundation to prove Black land ownership. After Jennifer, descendants and residents from Elaine will share their experience with living in this area and how their life is being impacted. We will then have an opportunity to contact TIA officials and ask them to go to Arkansas um, and see the damage from their practices and begin the discussion on reparations. Um, and finally, there will be opportunity to submit questions tonight to tonight's speakers. So please feel free to submit them as the webinar is going. All right, can we go to the next screen, please? So as I said, my name is Abigail Reese and I am a TIA Divest organizer. Um, I started with them last November. Uh, on the next screen, we're gonna learn a little bit more about what TIA Divest is. So TIA Divest is a grassroots organization that is actively fighting TIA's fossil fuel investments and land grabs. Founding members Bill Kish and Iris Marie Bloom discovered that TIA is investing in harmful and climate destructive things like the opening of the Cricket Valley frack gas power plant or the Line 3 pipeline. This discovery created TIA Divest, a group of volunteers that are climate-minded university professors, doctors, students, and retirees. These are our current demands. Tonight, we will fo be focusing more on demand number three. There will be future webinars on our other three demands, so please make sure to register for our mailing list to stay involved. Our first demand is that TIA must immediately divest all assets that support the extraction, transport, trade, or other contribution to the production of coal, oil, and gas. They must immediately halt any new investment in these companies, and then they must immediately stop investing in industrial agriculture and timberland. TIA must begin dialogue with indigenous peoples, black farmers, and other local communities harmed by land grabs about how to return land to local control and make reparations. And finally, TIA must publicly disclose the full extent and details of all their fossil fuel related assets and commit to full investment transparency. On the next page, we will learn more about some of the claims that TIA makes. TIA is spectacular at cultivating their green image. The 2022 TIA report, Ensuring Our Future, is full of claims from TIA on how they will um, and have operated to mitigate climate risk and be socially responsible. In this, they actually acknowledge the types of clients they have in the quotation we see at the very top, in which they say that they serve academics, government, medical, and other nonprofit fields, so they must invest in line with those values. Um, they also talk about how people are very important and a pillar of the way that they invest for their sustainability strategy, um, and that they try to invest by supporting food um, and access to um, local communities in which there is transparency to the stakeholders and how they are working with those local communities. However, on the next page, we'll learn more about why we are actually here. So in September, I attended the 104th commemoration of the Elaine, Arkansas massacre. In 1919, black sharecroppers and landowners were murdered by white mobs aided by federal troops after demanding fair price for cotton. While there, I witnessed firsthand the harm of TIA's farming practices on a community that has been exploited, threatened, and murdered for generations. TIA clients have had the, have the ability to demand change from one of the largest landowners in the world. TIA could lead the way to change by giving land back, stopping chemical spraying and harmful farming practices, and funding community repair. On the next slide, we're going to be able to see some of the damage that TIA is directly doing um, and how it kind of goes against what they claim. So TIA makes a claim it themselves that it is a core belief that climate risk is an investment risk. And what this means is that they don't believe that they should invest in things that are harmful to the climate because in the long run, it hurts them financially. However, while I was in Arkansas, I saw that this isn't necessary. 
necessarily the case in that there are a lot of um, climate risk things happening on their land. In the reports that Naveen and TIA have released, we are introduced to Naveen's responsible investing team. Naveen's responsible investing team provides training for investment and risk teams on climate change. These trainings enhance engagement on emerging climate issues and their financial materi materiality. One of the things that the team explores, and if we can go back um, to the last one, is opportunities in climate mitigation and avoided emissions. And so they're supposed to see ways that they can make sure that they're avoiding emissions. However, while I was there, I saw that TIA farm operators actually burn crop residue on their fields and that there was chemical damage to local organic farmland and trees. And by burning those, far, um, those crop residues, they're releasing carbon straight into the atmosphere. There was no evidence of use of sustainable practice to protect the soil, but there was evidence of practices that weren't sustainable and were actually um, harmful to the soil integrity over a long time. Nuveen released their climate report, um, and they are the investment manager for TIA, and they claim themselves that soil management is crucial to preserving, preserving the productivity of farmland and the health of surrounding ecosystems. However, Nuveen's farmers and TIA's farmers are using harmful chemicals and irresponsible tilling. This is leading to damage to the actual ecosystems that are around them and their own ecosystem in the future. And they also claim that they believe that their farmland investments can help to meet global demand for food while encouraging sustainable practices. But there is a common belief that if you live in a lane, then you die early because a lane is a food desert. There is a lot of chemicals and there just really isn't access to things like medical care. So after being there for the 104th commemoration, it was clear that with the burning of crop and the farming practices and the use of um, harmful chemicals, the TIA was not living up to their reputation. So next we're going to hear from Doug Hertzler, but first we're gonna see an excerpt from We Have Just Begun. This is a film from Michael Warren Wilson. We Have Just Begun takes its name from the secret passcode used by black union farmers and domestic workers organizing throughout the Arkansas Delta in 1919. A seven year investigation into the historical events in Phillips County, Arkansas, the film explores the legacy of exploitation, domination and resistance in the Delta and its ongoing cover up. In this clip, three residents of Elaine, Arkansas give personal testimony describing the effects of crop dusting on the health of the town and its population. I don't like when it spray my trees or my grass, when it killing my fruits and stuff like that. And also it making, you know, some older people sick, they'll come like right over the top of your house or and just spray. It's like they putting a the pollution out there to make some people sick. And I'm not, I'm not all right with that. You shouldn't be flying a pesticide airplane inside city limits and you know it's leaking pesticides. We see it all the time. It's surprised they ain't flying through here right now. It's kills, but look at my plants. They got my trees right there. You can tell they've been sprayed. They ain't bearing no fruits, they did. Yeah, he got sick. I got sick my phone. He came out and sprayed Elaine one time. We were trapping the field, they sprayed us. I was there by a doctor a long time behind it, taking uh, antibiotics and stuff like that. It blistered my skin. Whatever the chemical was, it blistered my skin. But we didn't get nothing for it. We had to pay the doctor bill. Back over where I live at is, is I stay right in front of the airport. I'm talking about they come over and they spray and they kill everything over there on my street. Cause I just lost my little girl and you know, she was down here, you know, the doctor was feeding her for congestions, but that was the problem. When we get her to uh, Memphis, Le Bonner Hospital Center, one of the nurses, doctors come in, they tell them she have a respiratory infection, but that's how my little girl died. And yes, it's not good to breed pesticides, especially these young kids. we're going to hear from Doug about TIA. Thanks. Uh, my name is Doug Hertzler and I'm a policy analyst at ActionAid USA and I am working with TIA to vest to get TIA to change how they manage my retirement savings. TIA is a Fortune 500 company with 1.2 trillion dollars under management. 
They have 12,000 institutional clients, including many of the colleges, universities, and hospitals in the United States, and also lots of small nonprofit organizations. Because of these relationships, TIA has a reputation of being a responsible investor, but nothing could be further from the truth at present. Next slide, please. According to the Institute for, for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, TIAA has about $78 billion of fossil fuel investments in its portfolio. But they are also the global leader in land grabbing, having acquired over 3 million acres of land, more than any other company globally. By, gra by land grabbing, I mean the accumulation of land on a large scale, by either legal or illegal means, and taking wealth away from local communities. It's a form of colonization. TIA's strategy is to buy up land in 10 countries to make money by holding it and selling it when the price increases. They typically buy farmland from large farming companies, injecting capital into their operations so that these companies can expand and farm even greater amounts of land. This method rewards local land grabbers and often causes deforestation of additional land. What TIA has done in Arkansas and Mississippi is very similar to what it has done in Brazil which has been widely reported on in the media. In these cases, TIA snapped up land in a region where there is a previous history, previous and ongoing history of violence and dispossession of local communities, especially indigenous people of color, indigenous people and people of color. Slide, next slide. Today we will, we will be talking about 46,000 acres of land that TIAA bought up all around Elaine, Arkansas, starting in 2010. Land that was first accumulated by a local company who bought it from white families who participated in the Elaine race massacre and or its cover-up. This land, this TIAA land around Elaine is a larger area than all of Washington, D.C. It is 72 square miles. Next slide. The kind of large-scale farming TIA engages in is the second highest cause of greenhouse gas emissions after fossil fuels. It is heavily dependent on chemical pesticides and fertilizers which are harmful to people in the environment. Here is a photo I took of a tractor spraying a cotton defoliant on TIA land south of Elaine. I had to zoom in on my cell phone camera from a distance and then, and, then, and then drive out of the way quickly to avoid the pesticide mist as it got closer. I also saw a spray plane flying over TIA land like you, like you saw in the video, uh, although I was not close enough to get a good photo, uh, thank goodness. Um, TIA's farm operator undoubtedly uses large amounts of Roundup, Paraquat, and Dicamba on its crops. These are chemicals linked to cancer, neurotoxicity, they can cause organ damage, skin rashes, and respiratory problems. Dicamba in particular is known for its propensity to stay airborne and drift long distances, damaging trees and crops and falling on unsuspecting people. Next slide. TIA's farms are using irrigation strategies that are depleting groundwater, allowing soil erosion and chemical runoff that contaminates waterways. I took this photo of a TIA field near the Mississippi River. You can see the irrigation rig in the background. There is no cover crop on these fields, no buffer between the drainage ditches in the field, and clear evidence in many places of soil erosion. I saw this sort of problem in many places as I drove around the edges of TIA land. Next slide. One thing that shocked me was that TIA's farms even get rid of grain crop residue by burning it and sending carbon into the air instead of incorporating it into the soil. Here I saw seven fires across a wide area of TIAA land on a Sunday morning. The day before I had seen fires on the same land that were even larger, but I was unable to get a photo because I was in the, in the back of, of a van with some of the, the people there from Elaine. Next slide. <clears throat> Lastly, TIA's land buying practices result in larger and larger farms which bypass the local economy and extract the wealth of the land and send it straight to Wall Street. They leave behind struggling communities and food deserts. Next.
Why is TIA doing this? They think they can make a lot of money off of bidding up prices for farmland, but they are also using it for greenwashing to counter the fact that they are keeping $78 billion in fossil fuel investments. They claim that in the future they will sequester carbon on their farmland. But an active credit carbon scheme that TIA participates in now has been shown by scientists to be smoke and mirrors, and experts say that there is not enough land in the world to offset fossil fuel emissions, nor is carbon sequestra soil carbon sequestration likely to be permanent. We need real cuts moving quickly towards real zero in carbon emissions, not false promises of net zero. In the meantime, TIA's land grab is harming communities around the world and standing in the way of social justice. TIA could lead the way to change by giving land back, stopping chemical spraying and harmful farming practices, and funding community repair. I turn the floor over to our next speaker, Jennifer Hadlock, to tell us more about her research on the land and the history of Elaine. Good evening. Thank you, Doug. I am a reparationist. I believe in reparations for black people due to slavery and all that has happened since. I am a white northerner, movement attorney, genealogist, and a community organizer. I am a truth teller. In this moment, truth is being covered up. We are in a battle in this country and state and here in Phillips County for the truth. I will be sharing some of what I have learned and trying to explain the story of the over 100 years of a slow massacre that is ongoing. Some of it may be hard to hear. Please take care of yourself. Next. Phillips County is in the Delta, 100 miles south of Memphis on the eastern side of Arkansas, right on the Mississippi River. The county is surrounded by rivers in all directions. Elaine is in the center of the county, but Helena, West Helena is the county seat. Phillips County has the highest percentage of black residents in the state of Arkansas. It is only 60 miles from the town in Mississippi where Emmett Till was murdered. South Phillips County and the northern part of Deshea County are very interconnected. North Deshea County is cut off from the rest of Deshea County by the rivers. Because of the flooding and constant shifting of the rivers, the soil here is very rich with sediment and is some of the best soil for growing crops. The control of the land and water and labor has been the battle here at least since the Europeans arrived. Next. On September 30th to October 2nd, 1919, at the end of the Red Summer, when many racially motivated violent murders had occurred around the country, in Phillips County, Arkansas, black farmers had organized a union to fight for full pay for ginning their cotton. In response, many hundreds of black people were murdered by posses of white men, and then federal troops were brought in and instead of helping, killed more black people. A committee of seven white planter owners from Helena was formed to determine what happened. No white people were arrested for these murders. About 200 black people were arrested and a sham trial sent 12 of them to death row for murder of a few white folks. Ida B. Wells was sent to document by the NAACP and she wrote a report, the Arkansas Race Riot. On appeal to the US Supreme Court, the Elaine 12 were released. This horrifying massacre has been investigated by many people, but the truth is still being covered up. Next. The Elaine Legacy Center's mission is to research, preserve, and share our oral narratives of the Elaine Massacre of 1919, and to build a village that is a center of Delta spirituality, culture, arts, music, and education for meaningful tourism so that we all have an above average income and above average wealth accumulation. Next. <laughs> The Legacy Center has been commemorating the Elaine Massacre of 1919 since 2012. A truth-seeking commission was held at ELC in 2019. Some people say there were only sharecroppers or a small number of Black landowners in 1919. As Ida B. Wells notes in her report, Paul Hall of the Elaine 12 was himself a landowner. 
and more of those arrested's extended families were landowners. This is important not because the sharecroppers and tenant farmers are less important, but because the story that has been molded by the white people with money, land, and power is erasing the land ownership. Oral history by Black families has kept this history alive. I honor their bravery and thank them for sharing with me. The same families who were here before the massacre on both the perpetrators and the survivors' side are still here. It is a showing of strength and resilience to still be here sharing the stories of the time before, during, and after the massacre. And TIAA has played an important role in the continued harm and has the opportunity to play an important role in stopping the harm and making repair. TIAA could lead the way to change by giving land back to the black and small farmers, stopping chemical spraying and harmful farming practices, and funding community health, healing, and repair. The truth is the first step. I'm just gonna give a small sample of the documentation I have found in the last year. Next. In 1870, there had already been 1,000 years of history of humans on this land. There was a horrible trail of tears and the removing of the quapaws through this area. Many folks here claim ancestral connection with those peoples. And there are still some remnants of the mound builders. In 1860, there were almost 9,000 people enslaved here by some of the same families who continue to have control. Next. According to the 1870 census, after the Civil War, almost 200 Black people owned land in Mississippi Township of North Deche County around Snow Lake. In south of Elaine Phillips County, known as Mooney Township in 1900, there were 27 black landowners and 28 white landowners. By 1910 in Mooney Township, there were 32 black landowners, including the Fergusons and the Martins. So the number of black landowners in Mooney was going up. During this time, there were also many racially motivated violent incidents. Night riding and white capping were not uncommon. As Richard Wright, the famous author who moved to Elaine in 1916 wrote in Black Boy, when we arrived in Elaine, I saw that Aunt Maggie lived in a bungalow that had a fence around it and wild flowers grew. Aunt Maggie's husband, Silas Hoskins, owned a saloon. He had a horse and buggy. One morning, Uncle Hoskins didn't come home. Before dawn, we were fleeing for our lives. I learned afterwards that Uncle Hoskins had been killed by whites who coveted his flourishing liquor business. Today, some white people with money try to control the narrative, say the area of South Phillips County in 1919 was unsettled. This doesn't sound like an unsettled area. It doesn't sound like all black people were sharecroppers. And it doesn't sound like you have to be the only one killed or arrested if white people want you gone. Your family members could be threatened as a consequence of your actions. So if you speak up, you may not be the person who receives the punishment. The Tulsa massacre we know was a punishment for black people having success. That is also true here in Phillips County, which happened before Tulsa. Next. The economic pressure in 1919 in Phillips County was intense. Many of the white men owners, planters, and cotton factors of Helena were trying to gain power and wealth. And several of them would be chosen by the governor to be on the Committee of Seven after the massacre and trusted to find out what happened. There was a tangled web of conflicts of interest. It is obvious why there is still so much confusion around what did happen. In 1919, the Southern Alluvial Land Association was advertising to bring investment and attract white people to the Delta. Pamphlets were produced to market the area. The land was advertised as having an incalculable supply of pure, sparkling artesian water under the ground. Thousands of flowing wells are to be found. This artesian water has contributed to good drainage as much as good health. The brochures claimed 100 crops could grow on the rich first seven inches of soil, immensely rich in lime, nitrogen, phosphorus, without any fertilizer. The ad explains dams, levees, and drainage districts, ditches have been built. Of course, we know the white planters didn't build the levees, ditches, or canals. Black people did. Next. In 1917, Congress passed a law to pay for levies working with local levy boards. This led to formation of many drainage districts and levy boards. Wealthy white landowners have controlled these levy boards and continue to today. Every landowner is paying a tax to them. 
And just like there is now a property tax sale, if unpaid after a couple years, the district makes a list of unpaid fees and announces that the land will be sold for the unpaid fees, sometimes very little amounts of money. These forfeiture auctions were and are happening. In July 1919, oil had been found nearby and leases for drilling were being written. Stock was being sold for an oil and gas company claiming leases on 50,000 acres in Phillips Lee and Deche County. The World Cotton Conference was coming in New Orleans, October 14th to 17th. Railroads were being built and rented land and rented land to store equipment and to pay for easements to build tracks was making people money. It was in this context of wealth and economic opportunity for the wealthy white men that the Elaine massacre occurred. But South Phillips and North Deche County were also thriving for black folks. Just as Richard Wright had described, the 200 black landowners of Deche County in 1870 were moving over the county line. Next, Ferguson. Isaac and Alminda Ferguson, a black couple, owned land in Deche County in 1870. By 1900, they moved to South Phillips County, where an almost all black town named Ferguson was founded. Isaac Ferguson was the postmaster in 1900. There was a black owned Ferguson gin and a store, a whole community of black landowners. This black thriving community growing in 1910 and building was a threat to the plans of the white landowners in Helena. Due to discrimination by banks and financial institutions, most black farmers had to borrow from individuals, and these individuals were your white neighbor or the owner you were renting from. Scams were common. All through the last over 100 years, there have been scams. Some were scaring people off land, some making it difficult to be there. This is still happening today. The Pikes, Jacksons, Flanaus, Scaifes, and Halls tell stories now in 2023 of neighboring white owners moving land demarcations planting or building on fields that are not theirs, letting livestock, livestock run loose to destroy crops, and when the sheriff, mayor, clerk, courthouse, and judge are also not sympathetic, who can you go to to enforce your land ownership boundaries? Next, Rashaw. Rashaw is south of Elaine. It is still easy to spot because it has Gumwood Church, which is protected by huge Gumwood trees. There is a ditch called the Yellow Bank Bayou and the railroad used to pass through. But on September 30th, 1919, attorney Bratton, a white attorney, was arrested at Rashaw where he was talking with black farmers about how to sue for the money owed for their cotton and their crops. The paper said Rashaw was the first lodge of the union which has been blamed for the massacre. In 1919, Rashaw area was owned by Theo Fathauer of Chicago who lived off Lakeshore Drive. In October 1919, less than two weeks after the massacre, Theo Fathauer redid his will and sold his Rashaw land over 4,000 acres to the Solomon brothers and Amos Jarman, the former sheriff. This deal in the papers was called the biggest land deal in Phillips County history. The land was later sold to Jesse Peter, who left the land to his sister, the poet Lily Peter. She fought to prevent chemicals from being used on her farm and she fought the Army Corps of Engineers from some of the redirecting of rivers they tried to do. Lily had three farm managers, Brooks Griffin, who was white and owned some land, and Fred and Sherman Duncan, two black men related to some people who still live in Phillips County. When Lily died, she left the farm to her nephew and ended up with Brooks Griffin. That land with funds from TIAA has now amassed into an empire. The Griffins live in Nashville and Helena, but have a giant plantation style home in Rashaw with a meticulously kept lawn. Next. Since 2010, Griffin has sold over 30,000 acres to TIAA, Teachers Insurance Annuity Association of America. TIAA has propped up and funded his amassing of more land. Griffin sold to an LLC called Global Ag Properties LLC for $158 million. Global Ag Properties LLC is TIAA. TIAA is one of the largest landowners in the world. They claim to be a racially just organization and that they are feeding the world. But we know most of what is growing here, soybeans, and we don't mean edamame, corn, not for eating, and cotton is not doing that. And the chemicals and control of water and the area is actually stopping local people from growing food and even staying here. Some people will know this land because it is what D-Line farms. Next. 
the current economic power structure here leads back to the time of the 1919 massacre and the current state of the land and schools and water is trying to move poor and black people out. The high amounts of herbicides and pesticides run off into the water. The people who control the water control the area. Farming needs land and labor, but without water, nothing will grow. The irrigation and flooding combined with the chemicals is killing people. The large amount of diesel and natural gas needed to power all the mechanically powered machinery to gin and cut and pick and truck and deliver and ship the soybeans, corn, rice, and cotton that is produced here is mind boggling and hurting people. Next. Hundreds of wells have been drilled. There is almost no oversight of this. Even in the state of Mississippi, there is more oversight of farm wells and the levy boards, which are elected here. And as of 2015, Phillips County is in a critical groundwater area. Recently, there was a boil order in Elaine and all the area south because it is one pump for all of it. The water system in Lakeview has had an ongoing off and on issue for the last few years, and Helena West Helena water system failure made national news this year. In the past, water was plentiful. Birds, bees, butterflies, frogs, creatures, and fruit trees and vegetables everywhere. People living all over, working hard, chopping cotton, not getting fair pay, but the water was clean, the food was good, the community was and is tight. Everyone knows each other or are related. Next. The Helena Chemical Company was created here. It is now part of a bigger agribusiness conglomerate, and the farmers here are reliant on the chemicals. Even if you don't want to be, the only seeds that will grow are those resistant to the chemicals because the chemical spreads. The Cedar Chemical Company was shut down after proof of contamination of the surrounding soil and water. It is a Superfund site. The big expensive farm machinery and use of chemicals instead of workers to weed and defoliate began in the 50s when soybeans became a big money making crop. Next. This area is also huge in farm subsidies for the big farmers. An attorney from nearby Monroe County was on 60 Minutes for his plotting of subsidies. D-Line Partnership, who farms the land owned by TIAA, is one of the biggest beneficiaries. Next. Phillips County has the worst in the state health statistics. Cancers and autoimmune diseases like lupus are common here. This is at least partly due to with the chemicals and the food desert. Dollar General and Walmart as your grocery limits healthy food access. A few people who do not even live here are making hundreds of millions, if not more, while destroying people, land, water, and air here. It needs to change. Again, TIAA has the chance to lead on this by giving land back to the black and small farmer, stopping the chemical spraying and harmful farming practices, and funding community health, healing, and repair. Thank you. I will now pass the mic to Justice of the Peace, Mrs. Lenora Marshall who was born and raised in this area and was a school teacher for many, many years. She's also the vice president of the Elaine Legacy Center. Mrs. Marshall. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening to all of you. As she has stated, my name is Lenora Marshall and I'm presently living in Elaine. I was born south of Elaine to a wonderful, uh, set of parents, uh, my mother and father uh, had 14 children and they were hardworking parents. They owned their own farm and they raised vegetables, they raised corn, they raised cotton, beans, and they also raised okra to sell to the market. And my mother garden. She raised turnip greens and mustard greens, collard greens, kales, and rapes. She raised Kentucky wonder beans and English peas, eggplants, spinach and lettuce and cabbage, cucumbers onions, bell peppers, red peppers, hot peppers, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, sweet peas, peanuts and popcorn, sweet corn, snap beans, purple hub peas, 
crowd of peas, butter beans, butter squash, which was known at that time as an upper ground sweet potato. She raised okra and squash and beets, watermelons and cantaloupes. And she even made ice cream during the time, winter time when there was snow on the ground because there were no chemicals around. So it made it relatively safe to use the snow to make ice cream for her children. Uh, my mother fed communities. She fed so many people. Um, uh, she didn't have a food pantry and you would think that because she had 14 children, she would hardly have enough food to feed them, but she fed everyone. And uh, she made such an impact on the community when she was laid to rest, her funeral service lasted five hours, mm -hmm. literally five hours because of the work that she had done. Um, the chemicals today that we are fighting are destroying so many things. We own uh, peach trees, pear trees. We did persimmon trees, pecan trees. And if you would take a picture of those trees today, it seemed uh, that you would only find dried limbs of those trees. My mother raised turkeys, Muscova ducks, Guinness, chickens, and from the chickens, we got eggs and uh, we had cattle. We had plenty of milk and butter. So uh, my mother looked at the people who were struggling, the poor who had nothing and who had food disparities and she addressed that issue. Um, from the hogs, naturally, we got the sausage and the bacon. And, and so we uh, shared. But today, if we would try to raise those same crops that she raised, uh, we would not be successful because of the chemicals that uh, we are combating. If uh, most people had done uh, the same job that my mother has done, her name would be written in the Guinness Book of Records or she would be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, we did not have all those chemicals back then. So today is a new day when we are fighting chemicals, we are dealing with uh, water boils because of the uh, 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 pollution. It's just uh, a new day. And uh, we're gonna have to find strategies to meet today's demand. I relinquish my time to Martin Blocker. Let me uh, just a little bit before I give it to Martin. Uh, I bother. Uh, back in 1880, uh, owned about 5,000 acres of land. On today, we have a little less than 200 acres of land that we are dealing with. Where the land went, I cannot tell. Okay, Martin. So I begin to discuss about how the chemical took effect on my life with my father, George Block. All them work with Rana, Jody Party, Larry Patton, Leroy McCullough, Charlie Gardner, Ralph Puto, all these guys that suffered from this impact and died afterwards. And then I look at the peach trees, the plum trees, the walnut trees, everything we had gone. 
have water. Some can irrigate, some can't. It's not as much water in the lake as we had. And we got mercury, our feet, a lot of feet full of mercury. Things growing in the lake that is real new that we have not seen. And I would say these words to finish my closure argument. If a cloth be cast up on the sea, Europe is the least to Paris as well as Maine. Because any man deaf to me is mean. Because I'm part of mankind and part of the continent and part of the Maine. So you never seem to know who the bear tone for. It tone for thee. Until we come together, the world gonna spell a drop. In order to build our country, and get us back what we need to do, we're going to have to take a, make a stand. And how can we do it? By joining hands together. Quit bickering with each other. Quit being jealous towards each other. When are we going to come together? And that's when God going to come heal the land. He ain't going to heal the land until we get right. So I'm, I've got to close my case. And thank y'all for listening to me. And then my pass it over to the lawyer, Jennifer Hotlaw. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're actually passing it back to Abigail. The Abigail. Mm -hmm. Good to see you again, Abigail. Good to see you again too, Mr. Martin. And I just want to thank the descendants and Jennifer for being willing to come on and for bringing this to our attention. Jennifer found us and made us a little bit more aware of the investment practices that TIA was doing. So I really want to thank the descendants and Jennifer for their bravery. Um, so up next, we are going to transition into an action. We have the opportunity today to reach out to TIA, to contact them online, to kind of make people aware of this direct harm they're doing with the chemical spraying and the damage to the land. And by doing this, what we're going to do is we're going to put some truth onto the reputation that TIA has expertly cultivated and hopefully get this chemical spraying to stop. I'm going to be sending a link in the chat right now that will allow you to access the Phillips County Arkansas Action Toolkit. This toolkit will give you a little bit more of a written explanation of what it is, uh, what is happening right now with TIA in Phillips County. As you scroll through the toolkit, you'll see that there's more than just information. There's links for you to take action right now. If you scroll down to the Take Action Now um, section, which is on the next page, you will see that you will have the opportunity to use some of the information you learned about today or the information that's provided for you above to write a email to Fasuna Brown Duckett and to make a demand that she addresses the damage caused by the toxic farming practices. TIA could lead the way to change by giving this land back, by stopping chemical spraying and harmful farming practices, and by funding community repair. They're saying that they're doing these things, so we're trying to get them to put their money where their mouth is and to stop harming this community. So please take a moment to click this number one and draft an email to demand that one, they immediately stop doing this and two, that they go out there um, and begin the conversation of reparations. If you keep going, you'll see you'll also have the opportunity to email Cornell Professor Maureen O'Hara, um, President Ronald Daniels at John Hopkins University and the trustees at TIA. This is just some other individuals that you can contact to again make the, the demand that they give land back, stop chemical spraying and harmful farming practices and fund community repair. So as you are going through um, hopefully this toolkit and are drafting these emails, we're going to take some time to answer some of the questions that we have received. Um, I encourage you to still take time to actively write these emails today so that we can send kind of a unified effort and show TIA that a lot of people are aware of these harmful practices and are not okay with it and that we're demanding for them to immediately stop it. So we're going to go ahead and transition over to the Q&A now while everybody is hopefully working on these emails. I already sent my email this morning, so I'm a little bit ahead. So hopefully you can all join me. Um, the first question that we are going to ask is going to be a question I'm going to hand to Doug, and it is very concerning. Did TIA share with you what chemicals they use, or did you test it? Where did this information come from? 
And this question comes from Laura. Uh, thanks, thanks. That's a very good question. And no, unfortunately, TIA does not um, publish or make publicly available exactly what what chemicals they're using. That's one thing that they should be transparent about. They should say exactly how much and what they're using. But we uh, did speak to, um, you know, to local people who know farm workers who have been around these farming operations for a while. And, and we know that for these kinds of crops that they're growing, soybeans, cotton, um, that these are the chemicals that are used basically on all large farms of this size. It's, it's not really possible um, to grow uh, soybeans without dicamba and Roundup on that, on that scale that they're doing it. Um, and then uh, same with cotton. It's not, there are, there's very little organic cotton grown in the world and this is clearly not organic cotton and so they're using uh, these chemicals on the cotton. Um, so I listed, I, the ones I mentioned were just the ones that, that are known to be used in the area. Um, I think that that probably covers it. Was there another part? That's everything for that question. Um, up next, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Um, and this is two questions from Gina. And she is hoping to understand how TIA is invested in the land and lane. So a little bit more with the D-Line farms. And then who manages these farms? Okay. Um, so it's, it is confusing, but the way that TIA is invested is they have Nuveen who does their farming practices and they create LLCs, limited liability companies to then purchase land. So here it's called, they have a few different names. They use different names in Mississippi where they're also doing this. Um, there's premier properties and there's global ag properties. So if you search um, the ownership list in Phillips County, you would find that they are one of the biggest landowners. Um, and they are all around Elaine. They're not directly in the city of Elaine, um, if that's what you're asking. Um, D-Line is the current tenant farmer. They are um, paying rent to TIAA or to um, Nuveen to uh, farm on their land, and they are doing these practices. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I hope that was a clear answer. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And up next, we have a question from CY. I'm going to hand this to Doug again. Uh, has the TIA Divest campaign connected with any land rights organizers in Brazil? Uh, yes, uh, TIA Divest has, has only contact, connected with them indirectly, but we are working in alliance with other organizations who are in direct contact with the uh, land rights organizers in Brazil. I, um, my job is, is with uh, an organization called Action Aid that works directly in Brazil, and, and we are partnering with some of the organizations working in the region where TIAA has bought up a lot of farmland. Um, and uh, for example, the, we're working with the Network for Social Justice and Human Rights in Brazil, and also with the uh, Pastoral Land Commission of the Catholic Church, which is on the ground in some of the most affected areas. And they have, they have people working to protect land rights of uh, indigenous and um, peasant communities there in Brazil, but but a lot of their land has already been stolen and and uh, TIAA owns nearly a million acres in Brazil. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Um, up next is a question that I'm actually going to answer. It's from Julie. Can you speak more to TIAA Divest future organizing plans? Um, so TI Divest does have a few things coming up, like um, we're going to do something called Divest a Ween, which is a social media action and an action directly targeting Marine O'Hara to focus more on these apps. Um, so that's a good time to join in if you want to maybe uh, join in, in the effort on doing some more harm to TIA's uh, 
reputation. The other thing is, is that on this link that I'm going to be sharing, in fact, I will share it right now, you have the capability to sign up so that you can continue to take action specifically in Phillips County. Um, so this is for TIA's um, harmful practices that are happening in Phillips County specifically, um, and TIA divest work in partnership with the Elaine Legacy Center. So if you look in the chat, there is a link tree link, which has um, the toolkit from tonight, um, some example social media posts, if you want to post on LinkedIn or Twitter about what you heard. And then it also has a stay involved tag so that you can go ahead and register for maybe supporting future actions that might come from the Elaine Legacy Center or anything like that. Um, so thank you for that question. Up next, so it looks like we got a good number of questions that just came in. So Jim asked, by giving the land back, how do you envision this? Try and get it back to the original family owners or what is the possibility of restarting a commons land available for beginning young farmers? Who would like to answer this? Um, that hasn't totally been worked out, but yes, we would tr definitely be trying to get back to people who wanted to still farm and to new farmers and perhaps a way to do some community cooperative farming. Um, there are lots of ideas about what, what kinds of farms, as Mrs. Marshall shared, as Mr. Blocker shared about how farming could be done, um, growing actual food. In oh, it's mm -hmm. it's okay. no, it's it can also be given back by uh, actually paying for the value of the land. Thank you. Um, up next, uh, can you summarize how the land got from Black families who were survivors of the massacre to 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 TIA, I was struggling to follow that part. And this is from Laura. Okay. Um, yes, it is complicated. And there are many stories. I only shared one example. Um, and I was sharing a story about how uh, Rashaw, which was not owned by Black people, but um, is where people were organizing to form the union um, and how that is now owned by David Brooks Griffin, who is the one who is benefiting. And he owns lots and lots of land and has gotten land um, from some of the Black families. There's land down in um, northern D.C. County that is directly um, was owned by Black families and is now owned by TAA. But it wasn't like TIA took it directly from the Black farmer. It's gone through a couple of other owners and then to David Brooks Griffin, who then sold it to TIAA. So up next, we have from Rin. How can we possibly expect a company like TIA with this long and immoral track record in many levels to ever be responsible and take a leadership position? Wouldn't public embarrassment of TIA be better than seeking their leadership? Um, I'm going to answer this. We do need to do public embarrassment. And that is why I'm encouraging you to do the social medias and to email them because they have such a stellar reputation. Um, a lot of people think that they are a green fund, that they are a progressive fund, and that they really give back to the communities that they invest in. And so really the number one thing that we can do is to continue to put pressure on them through all angles to get them to divest and stop these land grabs but to immediately stop these harmful chemical uses that are having damaging effects that are just immeasurable for the communities around them so it's it's kind of like a both scenario we need them to take action for the harm that they're doing and we also need to make the public aware of the harm they're doing so that we can force them to take action does anybody else want to add in to that question. And we got about 18 minutes left, it looks like. Um, so we'll just get through a couple more questions. There's actually quite a few and feel free to send them in as they're uh, coming up. 
The next one we have is from Iris. Could the first speaker who is a descendant please say the name of her mother? She sounds amazing and I want us all to honor and remember her. Leah of Soul Fire Farm, who wrote the book Farming While Black and now another book, Black Earth Wisdom, would love to hear about her, for example. And Jennifer, you are muted right now. So Miss Lenora, we cannot hear you. Yes, I am so delighted to be able to share that name. Uh, Perla Ardine Jackson. That's a name brand name because she served so many people. She did so many splendid things. Even in her, she called her garden a truck patch. And she would not allow people to go to that uh, truck patch because they would trample down her um, vegetables. So she took it upon herself to have all this manual labor going on, picking peas and so forth to give to people. So Perla Jackson uh, is, is, was, is well known, is truly well known. And so many of her works, her wonderful works are hidden. I just wish that people who uh, knew her could, could hear this story and, and confirm it. Yes. Can I add something to that? Perla, okay. <laughs> and did nobody have to know Perla Jackson was my mama, mother, Gladys Jackson, and she raised a beautiful family. And she taught all of the well. The Miss Martha can make preserves. Everything that we they were taught, my grandma taught us. And that legacy still live on. Perla Jackson or Dean Jackson. <laughs> She taught school in, in Illinois. She went all over the world. You know? That's all. That's all. And then up next. Up next. And if I may add, if I if I may add, she had a husband that stood beside her and endorsed most of the things that she did. She gave away so many hams until she had to do, she had to start passing those hams out quietly because she had given so many. But for 47 years, almost 50 years, they were married. And uh, so I was blessed to be raised not by just a single parent, but both parents, hardworking, yes. Thank you for sharing. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to actually ask you one more question. Did I hear correctly that there were around 400 Black landowners in and around Elaine and Phillips County and Deshaw County before the massacre? Thanks for your research. Two, 200 um, Black landowners in Northern Deshaw County before, yes, in 1870, right after um, the Civil War, and uh, some of them moved north to Mooney Township, where they formed uh, Ferguson, which is named after a Black man, which I think many people even here don't know that, um, and that has been erased, and there are people here who lived in Ferguson, um, and now even the sign that marked that town is gone, um, but yes, 200 Black landers. I'm Definitely going to write some of my research up and there are so many other pieces of it besides the TIA part tonight, we're really focused on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And, and may I also add, during our, our farming tenure, we did not use chemicals, we did manual label. I know about chopping cotton, picking cotton and there were no chemicals back at that time. And you probably weren't burning the crop residue either. Um, so the next question we have is from Cheryl. And Cheryl wants to know, is there a way to do an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed? Is there an op-ed section? We actually have had quite a few individuals do op-eds for TIA to invest, And I think that that would be a wonderful idea to get as many op-eds out there about this situation as possible. If this is something that you're interested in, you can register um, for staying involved and make a note about doing op-eds and we can support you through that process because we've had quite a few successfully published. 
Um, and I can share some links of that too later on. So thank you, Cheryl. I hope that you do sign up and we will definitely be sharing the recording from this next week too, so that we, um, you'll be able to rewatch and get some more information. So up next, um, will TIA Divest be planning to have any public protests to intend or promote? Yes, there has been some in the future and there will be some, and I'm sure there's going to be some in Elaine as well, and they'll need as many people to support too. So do make sure to um, register and sign up so that you can stay involved for um, future uh, actions. And then the next question is from Lisa, what is the plan if TIA gives the land or reparations to descendants? Who would be leading these efforts? Before I hand this off, I'm just going to say this is one of the big reasons that we want the Sunda Brown Ducket out there so that she can begin conversations with the community she's actively hurting. Um, we're just kind of the middleman that's giving the demand. But I will hand this over to Jennifer and the descendants too. Jennifer, do you have anything that you want to add? Okay, not this is not Jennifer, but I'll go first, Marshall. Uh, the plans that uh, if we can receive reparations, um, it's not difficult to do something in a place where there is nothing, absolutely nothing here in Elaine. So we're going to uh, uh, use that money if it ever come down the pike to uh, maybe bring a school back, bring grocery stores uh, to Elaine instead of having to uh, drive 30 miles uh, just to buy bell pepper or get fresh vegetables, uh, get a new water system so that we want to have to constantly come back uh, water boils, uh, look for homes, apartments, uh, single apartments, uh, for people to have a decent place to live, uh, whatever we can do the, to uh, bring our chemical spraying to an end. So there's a multiplicity of things that we are plan to do if we ever have the privilege of uh, receiving these reparations. Jennifer, I yield to you. I'm sorry, I, the question was just what would, the rep what would we do with reparations? Is that what the question was? Um, mm -hmm. Let me go back to it, sorry. Uh, who would be leading these efforts? Who would be leading the efforts? It could be a team effort, not just one person. It could be a committee of people working together mm -hmm. for the common cause. We did have a town hall yesterday um, and 10 residents of the area um, volunteered to be on the follow-up committee and they would be leading the effort. Mm -hmm. Next, we have a question from Christy about has TIA Divest had justice and transparency success with TIA? Um, you can refer to our demands page on our website, and that tells the stories of our attempts of trying to get some transparency from TIA. And I think we'll show why it's very important that we all take action today. Um, the next question that we have is from Carlos and it is, it is part of this campaign to research health outcomes with various cancer related to pesticides or advance the campaign. Yes, I think that that is something that needs to be researched and I'll hand that over to the local so that they can talk a little bit more about that. Answer. There, there have been supposedly uh, research done here. Um, there is definitely, there are, so many funerals um, and people are known to die early um, here. And we believe that a lot of this is related to the practices of the farmers. Um, but proving that and getting uh, the local medical community to be able to do that has proved challenging, but there are definitely reports about how dicamba has caused cancer. There are lawsuits about Roundup causing cancer. Um, 
and so these and, and other diseases and definitely lots and lots of oral stories about the harms that people have. And while we cannot say that there is validity to that statement, um, we can say that we've observed uh, not only our plants dying, but so many people in this area are passing away with cancer. And there are quite a few that I know in this region that's battling cancer now. So that would lead us to believe that there's some correlation. Also lots of breathing problems. Absolutely, breathing problems. Thank you for sharing. And then we have another question from Sally that says there are many people with investments in TIA who TIA investors have no idea of the harm they are doing. Do you recommend pulling money out? No. If you pull that money out, you no longer have a say or control over TIA. You have power um, as a TIA client. And TIA has offered zero transparency, as we've kind of talked about, and really isn't working with us. So by removing your money, you're removing your power. Um, so if you go on our website, there's a little bit more information about what you can do as an individual divester, but it's more powerful if TIA clients are putting this pressure on TIA to take action. Is there anything that anybody would like to add on that, Doug? Yeah, I, I would just say this is, of course, a complicated and, and, and personal question in some ways, because um, I, I, for example, have some money in TIA, and I would like to take it out because I'd like to wash my hands of this, uh, you know, not be involved in this whole mess. But but I, right now, I've, I've, I feel like it's still, we've been working on it for a while, but it's still time to stay engaged and to and to push them, not because I want my money in TIA, but because because I feel like it's our our obligation to try to create change. Next, uh, we have a question. Could we talk a little bit more about the action emails we're sending, not just to TIA CEO, but also to the Nuveen CEO? Yes. So the reason we are sending these actions is one, so they're aware of the practices that their um, farm hand, that the people that are farming their land are doing, and two, so that we can make this demand that they stop spraying. Right. Um, obviously, if we don't contact them and if we don't tell them that they need to stop what we're doing, we're not going to open up that dialogue. So that's why we're specifically writing to the TIA CEO and to the Nuveen CEO is so that one, we can bring this to their awareness, and two, get them to stop this immediate harm. And I'm also going to hand it over to Doug. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to highlight, Abigail, that, that, that two of the emails on there are, are TIA governors and trustees who work for academic institutions. And there's also an email for all the trustees. So most of the trustees are, are members of TIA, the people who you know oversee the CEO, uh, the governors and the trustees, they are... Um, a lot of them work for your for your academic institution. So the president of Johns Hopkins University is is one of them, and uh, and we've also uh, are reaching out to um, one of the faculty members at Cornell. Yes, and there will be a action targeting her on Halloween where a lot of Cornell students are going to be sending her little Halloween graphics offering, asking her to stop tricking people and to give people the treat of no longer using these harmful chemicals. Um, so it's a little fun way to, to target her and we're gonna give a bag of candy as well. Um, so I believe we have time for one more question. And sorry, I'm just scrolling through because again, some more had just popped up. I just want to clarify that the recording will be um, available in the link tree that's sent to everybody and we will also email you when that link is available too. So you will be made aware when the recording is ready. Uh, Carlos is wondering if there's a tool or map or document where we can see other locations and communities that are being harmed by TIA. Doug? Yes, um, you know, this is, this is one, uh, 
not exactly a victory, sort of a minor concession that, that other organizations who have been working on TIA land have gotten from TIA. But it's not a very good map. In fact, it's a very bad map. Uh, if you go to, to Nuveen, there, uh, Nuveen's, there is a farmland transparency map, they call it. Um, and that's because we were demanding transparency. But, but it actually has a map with some points on it that doesn't really show where the farms are. If you, if you zoom in, like I, I had no idea. It doesn't look like there's this much land concentrated in one place in Arkansas when I, when I looked at this map. It looks like it's scattered around. But yet it's all here right around Elaine. Um, anyway, but you can go there and see some of the states and countries where they own land and, and get an idea of where you might look for, uh, look for these problems. I myself have been to TIA land in Pennsylvania and California uh, and Illinois. And I've, these believe me, these problems that exist everywhere because they're just doing standard industry practices. Their sustainability uh, reports are a mirage. And so with that, I just want to highlight something from Donna that says, I love the way your community has mobilized to have community development be such a strong part of reparations. I agree. And I think that it's very important that we continue to email, um, to tweet, to Facebook, to do everything that we can to make TIA aware that, that they need to immediately halt the destruction that they're doing in Phillips County and that they need to begin the conversation of reparations and land back. So thank you so much to everybody that took time to join us today. We had over 100 attendees um, come through. Uh, please make sure to share the links from tonight and to encourage people to take action so that we can make sure that this harm is immediately stopped and that community development and reparations are began. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jennifer and to the descendants so that they can give us a goodbye for tonight. And I again want to thank them for being um, willing to come on and share their stories and be so open. And, and a reminder, we will send a follow-up email tomorrow and you'll get the link to the recording as soon as it is available. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate everyone who took the time to come and I really honor all the people here in Phillips County um, and admire their bravery and strength in staying here and fighting back all this time. I agree with what she just said emphatically. And what is more, I appreciate each of you, all of your hard work and dedication to make this thing happen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And if your, question, mm -hmm. Thank you. if your question did not get answered, please feel free to contact us. You can put it in the stay involved. Um, we there's a lot of different ways that you can be in contact with us and bill just sent the tia divest website and the elaine legacy center websites also linked in the toolkit if you want to stay involved thank you so much for taking time out of your night to join us and share space with us and i look forward to winning this fight with you all <laughs>